majority of course our candidate, Mr. Alusaimni. I welcome uh, the, uh, you at the PhD uh, ceremony, and of course your supervisors, Professor Timel, Dr. Yahan Shai, and uh, Dr. Hesham, and of course also a firmly welcome to the opponents, whom you will meet later on, and welcome all people uh, online, all family and friends and colleagues, and lots of success, Mr. Alozaimi. And first of all, we can um, start with a short presentation of your work, which you will present in the forthcoming 15 minutes. Obanant promotion team, fellow researcher, friends and family. It's honor to present my, my PhD uh, the, uh, thesis today. Uh, Uh, to begin with, Parkinson's disease is second common brain degenerative disorder affecting millions of people worldwide. It's characterized, it characterized by motor symptoms it in full screen. and non-motor symptoms. Uh, do you hear me? Is it shared? Yes, that's full Do you screen. see the screen? Okay. So... Uh, to begin with, Parkinson's disease is a second common uh, brain degenerative disorder affecting millions of people. It's characterized by both motor and non-motor symptoms. Motor symptoms uh, include tremor with hand shaking at risk, rigidity with described as muscle stiffness and slowness of movement. Non-motor symptoms can range from cognitive impairment to mood and sleep disorder. For several decades, the primary treatment for Parkinson's disease, disease revolved around dopamine replacement therapy. Dopamine is a, a brain transmitter system uh, involved in controlling movement. Its deficiency due to the degeneration of dopamine cell in the substantial nigra, which is a hallmark of Parkinson's pathology. Medication are used to rebalance dopamine level and elevate motor symptoms. However, dopamine therapy is not without disadvantage. One significant issue is the fluctuation response of medication. This means that maintaining consistent symptom control is difficult, where patients experience period of uh, man well-managed symptoms on and period of worsened symptoms off. Moreover, long-term use of dopamine uh, develop side effects such as in, uh, dyskinesia. Dyskinesia means uh, involuntary or abnormal movement, which can disturb the patient quality of life. Given this limitation, there is an urgent need to improve other treatment options. One of these options is deep brain stimulation, which became a standard treatment for Parkinson. It has significantly improved the motor symptoms and enhanced the quality of patient, uh, a quality of life for many patients. However, it's required a surgical intervention to implant a hard weight of electrode into a specific brain region. As with any surgical procedure, there are risks. Brain bleeding and infection are the potential risks. Also, ele electrode may require replacement or adjustment in case of animal function. Actually, regular follow-up appointments are necessary to ensure the system functionality. In addition, DBS is expensive. On average, the cost of the surgery, follow-up, and ongoing care for five years is approximately 180,000 for each patient. One more challenge is that the exact mechanism of DBS is not fully revealed. However, DBS delivers electrical impulse to a uh, uh, targeted brain area, which have electrophysiology readout, shown as local nerve cells firing ring change, which extend to remote area. 
apart from the electrophysiology mechanism of DBS, this influences neural network may, might indirectly affect brain transmitter release. For example, deep brain stimulation of subthalamic nucleus lead to increased dopamine release in striatum. Interestingly, DBS also affects the serotonin in the dorsal raphae nucleus, which is a brain region involved in regulating mood. However, the exact underlying mechanism of this indirect effect on brain transmitter still need to be studied and investigated thoroughly. So our aim and objective, first, to explore the mechanism of electrical DBS behind the underlying side effect on brain transmitter system. Second objective is to explore a novel approach such as nanotechnology to address the challenges, the limitation of conventional deep brain stimulation. So we constructed our study focusing on the main issue of DBS, dividing in two, two parts. Part one is the conventional DBS. We started with a comprehensive literature review to explore the effect of DBS on main transmitter system. Then we move with the first study where we investigate the long-term effect of subthalamic DBS on serotonin. Second study, we, we, uh, we assess whether the drug modulation of globus pilides have an effect on serotonin pathway. Next, we investigate the association between the therapeutic effect outcome of the subthalamic nucleus on acetylcholine system. In bar two, we started with editorial review discussing the nanomaterial as a DBS uh, tool. Then we moved to our last study where we investigate the wireless stim uh, stimulation of subthalamic nucleus and its effect on monoamine system. So, first, I review literature about the underlying therapeutic and side effect of DBS on main brain transmitter system. Subthalamic, uh, subthalamic DBS affect multiple regions. In the preclinical data, the, the therapeutic effect is believed to due to increase the release of dopamine in the synapses of serotonin uh, uh, striatum. Additionally, DBS impact other regions such as the globe plates internal and external. In addition, mood related side effects are believed to due to the sub, uh, effect of subthalamic DBS on serotonin cell in the dorsal raphe. Uh, also, there is no direct connection between the ST and, and the dorsal raphe, but uh, uh, evidence from our colleagues suggests that it's a relay station from another region called lateral habenola. So in our first study, we have used genetically modified mice to target the serotonin cell. The mice were in injected with the medication to induce Parkinsonian. Then the mice were also uh, uh, implanted with the custom DBS in the STN and a fiber implanted in the dorsal raphe to measure the cell activity. Afterward, the mice underwent a behavior testing uh, to assess locomotion. And we use, we, uh, we, this is done by training the mice to walk inside a narrow corridor and record their locomotion. Furthermore, a force swim test was also used to assess the breath-like behavior. At the end of the behavioral test, the, the animal was stimulated uh, one more time and then sacrificed for histology study. Uh, our, the corridor work test showed an improved function in the stimulated mice. Interestingly, regardless if the, if the mice was Parkinsonian or healthy, the, the, the mice shows in both groups uh, a depressive-like behavior. As these mice were genetically modified to target a serotonin cell, a specific cell type calcium imaging 
revealed a clear reduction in serotonin cell activity. Then we moved to the histology study. There was decrease in the serotonin expressing cell. Cell was uh, transfected with the virus and tagged in a green. After sacrificing the animal, we performed histology study where we stained serotonin producing cell. Our observation indicate that there is a significant loss in serotonin cell phenotype, which further explain the depressive-like behavior observed. Then we move to the, uh, our next study. Since there is no direct connection between the ST and the dojarafe, and globus pilidus is affected by SDBS of the STN, and also recent evidence suggests that globus pilidus also project to the dorsal So we aimed in this, uh, in this study to investigate whether globus pilidus externa is a relief station. To achieve that, we use design and drug uh, approach where mice were injected with the virus in the globus pilidus externa to either inhibit or excite, uh, while a control virus were injected in the dorsal lafe. The, modul the, mod the modulation of the globus pilidus didn't show any impact on the serotonin system in the dorsal lafe. And, and this could uh, suggest that globus pilidus does not mediate this effect. And, and it should be, uh, and this might be explained by earlier findings of the brain in lateral hebanola. Move to next chapter. As sub subthalamic uh, DBS have a limited effect on gait and axial symptoms in Parkinson's patient, thus we investigate whether uh, DBS of the STN affect, affect the acetylcholine system. We have performed histology study to assist the acetylcholine in the Budenkultain nucleus, and there was, despite there was a significant decrease in the acetylcholine cell population, DBS does not affect the acetylcholine cell activity. Then, in part two, as conventional DBS have, have undoubtedly successful outcome, however, some, there are some limitations, such as invasiveness and cost. This is where nanotechnology comes. By harnessing unique probabilities of the nanomaterial, researchers are exploring the development of invasive approach. Uh, this advancement aims to minimize the surgical invasiveness and uh, reduce the need for follow-up procedure. In addition, nanotechnology offers the potential to create a smaller and more precise electrode and device. These devices can be designed to be flexible, bicompatible, and capable of wireless stimulation. However, the challenge remains that to ensure that long safety and also to deliver the nano material to specific brain area. In our last study, we, we have investigated the novel nanoparticle that can generate electrical field in response to magnetic stimulation. And uh, we have, for this stage, it's a proof of concept. So we surgically inject uh, in, uh, the nanoparticle uh, into the STN. And then after a recovery, we conduct a behavior test and assess locomotion. Uh, 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 following last stimulation, we sacrificed the animal and performed histology to examine brain activity. During open field test, we observed that the stimulated animal increased locomotion. In addition, there was increase in brain activity in brain region responsible for movement and behavior. Additionally, we, we observed that the wireless stimulation in a dopamine cell in the ventral segmental area. This outcome may be explained the hyperlocomotion we observed 
in the stimulated animal. In addition, we also uh, absorb a, a reduction in brain activity in the dose, uh, serotonin cell in the dorsal raphae. Interestingly, we observed that acetylcholine was not affected. Altogether, these findings are somehow comparable to the conventional TBS. Finally, to sum up my main, and, uh, main findings and conclusion, first, nanomines such as dopamine, serotonin, and neuroadrenaline is involved in pathophysiology of Parkinson. Subthalamic DBS inhibits serotonin, uh, serotonin cell activity. This inhibition may result in neuroblastic changes in the cell phenotype. Furthermore, drug modulation globe display does not show any impact on the serotonin doors of Raphael. However, earlier evidence suggests that the relay station is through the lateral heaven alone. Uh, additionally, thermic so DBS did not impact the scalpuline system, and this is explained the limited effect of uh, STN DBS on gait and axle, where DBS affect and motor symptoms is rather mediated through cortical or other brain pathway. Alternative DBS technique using nanoparticle shows a similar effect to the conventional DBS in terms of locomotion and neurochemistry. This highlights a potential of less and cost-effective approach. However, future research is needed to further develop uh, this technology and in particular tested in uh, disease models such as Parkinson. Uh, thank you so much. I would give the back the floor to uh, Pro Rector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alosaimi. And now we go to the first opponent, who's also a member of the assessment committee, that's Professor Benazouz. And he's a professor in neuroscience in the Université de Bordeaux in France. And thank you for coming all the way from Bordeaux, albeit online, Professor Benazouz, because the University of Maastricht is always glad with people from abroad. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Director, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alosaimi, and congratulations for, for all this work, very interesting results and publications. And my, my, it, it's always a pleasure to be in the jury of the PhD thesis uh, from stu uh, student, for students from Maastricht. My, my first question will be about the last uh, um, chapter about the nanoparticles. And uh, you said that uh, the effect, the behavioral effect of uh, the electromagnetic stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus have the same effect similar to what happened with deep brain stimulation. And we know that deep brain stimulation is uh, uh, improving the symptoms by inhibiting and desynchronizing the oscillations in the subthalamic nucleus. And with the electromagnetic stimulation of nanoparticles, we you are activating the cells. And I want just to understand what do you think about the mechanism that can be involved to give the same effect with two different mechanisms? Uh the, thank you so much for your question. Uh, highly estimated, uh, 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 highly estimated opponent. Thank you for your question. Uh, so our observation, according to my best knowledge, our observations based on the outcome we have. So the outcome we have, we showed uh, when we compared to the conventional DBS that it's increased the locomotion, it's increased the selectivity in the motor cortex and other related region. However, uh, regarding the mechanistic, the working mechanistic of nanoparticle, uh, we don't have like enough data. To, yeah, we know that it's improving, it's uh, stimulating the the uh, uh, the, the subthalamic, but it's not. For, for sure, it's not like the, the conventional where right? there's a, some theory to say that by, uh, by the inhibition, the local inhibition of the uh, overactive uh, beta oscillation. 
However, we don't have uh, data, detailed data in the electrophysiology. I would, I would be happy if we can do electrophysiological study measuring this, uh, the, the local potential uh, activity in the neurons around the nanoparticle, but up, uh, up to, uh, to my best knowledge, I don't think we have uh, details about this uh, information about the nanoparticle as far as I know. Yeah. Thank you. Can I give the second question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, my second question is about the effect of the subthalamic deep brain stimulation on the inhibition of the dorsal raphe neurons. You said that we have no direct connection from the subthalamic nucleus and the dorsal raphe, and you think that the mechanism is through the abenula. And how it can work through the abenula. What happened to the abenula when you are stimulating the subthalamic nucleus with high frequency? So uh, we think that the literal, uh, the STM affecting the, uh, the, the, the dorsal raphe uh, send the information to the literal habenula and then uh, so the, the projection, the, the study from uh, Tan and all, they, they, they trace the, the, the effect of uh, STMDVS, and they found that the literal herbinella activated in response to uh, the, uh, the, the STM stimulation. And according to that, they, the, yeah, do, this is the, the best, evidence that it's go indirectly through the literal habanella. So, so the, from the STN to the literal habanella and then to the dorsal rafa. Mm. And what, what kind of neurotransmitter is uh, involved in this pathway from the abenula to the dorsal rafa? What it's, are you uh, activating? It's activated the gabergic neurons. Okay. Mm -hmm. As far you. as I know. Thank you. I have a, a, a third, a last question. Can I? Or... No, I'm. I'm afraid we are running out of time. So no, perhaps, no problem. Second, okay. perhaps if you have a second round. Thank you very no much, problem. Professor Benazus, Thank for you. your opposition. The following, you. Op the following opponent is also a member of the assessment committee. That's Dr. Janssen, and he's a neurologist and a neurophysiologist in the Department of Clinical Neurophysiology in the University of Maastricht and the Maastricht University Medical Center. Dr. Jans. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. And dear Mr. Candidate, um, first of all, I also would like to congratulate you uh, and your promotion team uh, with this work. Uh, this uh, actually brought new insights to the research line, which already has been established a long time ago. And not only is the, the impact of the classical DBS on the neurotransmitter systems investigated, but you also yeah, so it's really nice new novel methods to stimulate the brain using nanoparticles. It was actually a joy to, to read your thesis. Um, but my role today is not only to applaud you and but also to ask you some questions on the work you just uh, presented. Uh, my first question, uh, Mr. Candidate, concerns chapter three. In, in, in chapter three, so you use the MPTP uh, model and maybe you can first explain to us how you validated the Parkinson phenotype in your animal model. You might maybe use figure one on page 56. So, yeah, I didn't discuss the, the thank you so much, uh, esteemed uh, government for that uh, question. Uh, uh, for the short of time, we didn't, we, we didn't discuss further the, the, how we validate the, the the Parkinson model. We have used medication uh, uh, called methyl uh, uh, MB, MBTB toxin to uh, was injected systemically, and this medication uh, caused a degeneration of the dopaminergic cells in uh, in majority in uh, in uh, in the substantia nigra, but also in BTA, but the majority in, in substantia nigra, and we have confirmed the, the Parkinsonian phenotype 
using histology, we have stay, uh, immunohistochemistry, we stain the, the mice uh, with the tyrosine hydroxylase, which uh, dopamine producing precursor. And then we counted the cell and we found uh, a very uh, significant decrease in, in the uh, TH cell degeneration around 60%. So from that, uh, histological wise, we have uh, confirmed. And further confirmation was using I'm the behavior to interrupt test. You. I'm going to interrupt you briefly, Mr. Kennedy. So you probably refer to figure 1E uh, with the histology. Yeah? So you have the TH cell count yeah. in figure 1E. And you say, so we counted yeah. the, the TH cells in the animal. But when I count there, I only see 10 animals. So five in the, I think from the MPTP group and five from the control group. Well, in your methods yeah. you described, you use 56 animals. I, I was a bit puzzled. Uh, actually for this, we did only because it, it's well validated uh, approach. So it's well known since a long time ago that this toxin induced. Here we just work Careful. So I shall. I we chose randomly five from each. But okay, so I understand. Let's so you, you took behave. a sample of uh, yeah. of the total group to actually validate the. And we did okay, some semi quality. Did you also you use so you also use the behavioral setup? Yeah, uh, behavior. Actually, the first validation was through the behavioral setup, a test called catwalk. And it was clear that uh, the, uh, the, our results uh, using uh, multiple parameters, including average speed, stance, uh, terminal dual stance, and, uh, and also the, uh, the step cycle. And those, all, all of the, those uh, representative for the gait and the uh, Local, uh, and uh, yeah, and the uh, motor symptoms of Parkinson, and mm -hmm. and it shows a clear uh, phenotypic and the behavior as well. But after the behavior results, we we tend to uh, yeah to test histologically, and it was in both the histology and behavior, we we show uh, the Parkinsonian phenotype yeah, so, uh, very clearly. Due to time, I'm going to. Maybe we can move to the, the main results of, uh, of chapter three, yeah? so described in figure two on page 57. So you actually, as earlier described by the same research team, you see a huge inhibition eh, of the raffin neurons, the serotonergic raffin neurons, if you turn on the stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus, um, which is shown nicely in, in figures A to D. And then you also, again, here, you uh, did a behavioral assessment of the animals, huh? uh, which you present then in figure 2E with the four swim task. And then in, you also, in the next page, you state uh, the breast fly behavior uh, was observed in both MPTP and NACL treated mice. And then actually a bit further in your supplements, so supplement S2, um, I looked at this figure and I thought, hmm, is this really two? So maybe you can uh, have a look at figure S2 on page 65. And then maybe mm -hmm. do you still like support your statement that the depressive like behavior isn't really present in both the MPTP group and in the control group? Yeah. Uh, you refer to first swim test, yeah? So uh, figure uh, S2 figure on page S2? 65. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yes. this is when we compare four groups, uh, we didn't find the beginning in the a significant effect. But when we when we compared the shams alone, we didn't find a significant effect. And then we bought the the stimulated and non-stimulated. So we have like DBS group, both MBT uh, uh, Parkinsonian or nor uh, healthy uh, mice. And then we boil it together. In that in that case, we find significant effect in the stimulated group. And and this if is would also visually that. inspect figure. If you would visually inspect figure S two, then I agree. You see huge effect on the stimulation in the in, in, in the control group treated with NSCL. But then in the other group, yeah, yeah, it's it's not that clear. So. Uh, 
be a bit cautious in this here would be needed. Would, would you agree with this or you think, no, it is really present in both groups? Uh, can you, uh, can, uh, I didn't understand the question. Can you replace it, please? So do, do, so do you really think that the effect is present in the MPTP group as well as the NACL group if you inspect figure S2? Yeah, I agree with you that is more prominent in the MBTB. Yeah, I agree with you. It's more clear in the MBTB than in the control. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, statistically wise, we didn't find any significant effect here. I understand. Yeah, I have many more questions, but uh, I think also the other opponents would like to ask uh, some questions to you. So therefore, I thank you for your answers and give back the word to the pro-rector. Thank you very much, Dr. Janssen, for your position. Now we come to the following opponent, who was also a member of the assessment committee, and that's Dr. Rijkers, as is a neurosurgeon in the Maastricht University Medical Center. Dr. Rijkers. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear Mr. Candidates, first of all, congratulations for you and your team. You've been studying certain aspects of DBS in Parkinson's disease. For humanity, Parkinson's disease is both a curse and a blessing. A curse for those suffering from it, but a blessing for those studying it, because by studying Parkinson's disease, we're beginning to understand the functional anatomy of the basal ganglia and your research research has also contributed to this. I have some questions. In chapter three, you study neurotransmitter specification in DBS and you focus on 5-HT. You're using a genetically modified mouse model injected with MPTP uh, and these mice receive DBS of the SCN and simultaneously get extra interventions in the DRN to study what happens to 5-HT exactly. And there appears to be 5-HT re-specification, if I understand this correctly. There are more ways, more uh, animal models to study uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, did you have to use mice because you wanted to use the genetically modified option? Uh, uh, thank, um, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, it's more practical uh, to use mice that transgenically, uh, transgenically uh, Modified. So it's more practical and cheap, to be honest. Okay, so if you, if you would like to confirm your finding, um, uh, because now you've only confirmed it in one species, would you like to confirm it in other species? And how would you like to do this? If I would, yeah, if I would do it, I would do it in, in another model. I would do it in the cyclene, alpha cyclene model. Mm -hmm. And because is it all the discussion is uh, now discuss all the evidence are now discussing about the pathology of alpha cyclin because MBTB only causes local degeneration in the in the dopaminergic cells and it's in the entire dopamine even if it's validated and it's the majority affected is the and the predominantly uh, uh, predominant region that have dopamine is substantial nigra, but still it's not presuming 100% the, the, maybe the, the model. So mm -hmm. I would do it in a, in a more, uh, yeah, in a, in a different animal model, like alpha cyclin. Okay. And, um, and, and see, do, do you think you also see? Yeah. Do you, do you also need 56 uh, uh, animals then, or could you, uh, if you don't use a, a genetically modified uh, animal, do you, okay, can you drop some of the experiments, or do you think the setup is going to be similar, or would you, or do you need a completely different experiment if you need to, if you use a different kind of model? Um. I would use this, uh, yeah, I would speculate that I would use the same mod uh, model. Uh, 65 is a little, a little too much 
So I would do first a size, a sample size uh, calculation for what I exactly want to do. And then based on that, I will calculate how many animals I would need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so to uh, uh, go on to the next chapter, chapter four, I was wondering, uh, you you have an hypothesis in chapter four about the way the SCN and the uh, Rafi nucleus are connected. Uh, were there any clues for chapter three that led to this hypothesis or was it coming from somewhere else? So it's, it's based from the literature that uh, from the literature that there is no direct connection between the stay and the and the global splice externa. And then this effect might be mediated by another brain area. Uh, the, from our colleagues, uh, Tan and all, and Harting and, and all, they they did this research and, and they found that literal hybrid might be involved. But also when we investigated uh, the globus plidus, globus plidus is affected, actually the, the, the thyroid rate uh, globus plidus is affected by ST and DBS. And there is recent evidence suggests that there is bidirect effect from the globus plidus to dose rafe and the other way around. So also dose rafe project to the globus plidus external. So this is why we thought, so maybe it's also go through other regions and um, maybe global splits extend also the, the pathway of this effect. Yeah, and so um, for that, yeah. Are there yeah. any other candidate regions apart from the uh, uh, lateral habenula and the, uh, the GPE that uh, could be involved in this connection? Also, the um, other evidence they suggest also the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I am not quite, uh, yeah. But, uh, according to my best knowledge, these two, this two are uh, contacted from DBSST and to uh, other nuclei and then back to the dorsal Okay. So, and do you as think? Far as I remember. Do you think it's worthwhile to continue looking for this uh, uh, functional connection? Uh, is it clinically very relevant? Can you use it in uh, in the future for the patients? Or do you think uh, this uh, you should go to another area and, and look for other ways that basal ganglia are connected? Short answer, please. Short answer. Yeah, I I think in general, understanding the underlying mechanism in the future will will develop will will improve the treatment anyway if we understand how the ebs behave behavior and in which by the way they go i think it's helpful in the long term not direct help for the clinical uh, setting okay thank you i'm and giving you thank you thank you Thank you very much for your position, Dr. Rijkers. The following opponent is Professor Blokland. He's professor in neuroscience in the University of Maastricht. And uh, for today, he has also accepted the role of secretary of this committee, for which I'm very grateful. Professor Blokland. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, I have um, I first want to compliment you with the, uh, with the nice thesis, and also, of course, your supervising team, who has helped you through this difficult years, I suppose they were difficult. And there's always, always the case with science. Um, and um, it's a really nice thesis because it makes um, this whole uh, idea about uh, the brain stimulation even more complicated and how to understand really what's going on in the brain of this uh, STN, um, the brain stimulation. Uh, I thought we, we knew a lot, but um, you again, show some other things that make things possibly even more complex and even more even more difficult to understand. Um, when I read your statements, um, and when I read um, uh, statement uh, number, what was it now? Number five. So the improving motor symptoms may not be related to the cholinergic system. So it's not a really statement, I would say, because you're not really sure if it is the case. 
And I was a little bit surprised that you um, dive into the world of um, astral cooline, whereas your the title of your thesis is the monaminergic nervous metal systems underlie the therapeutic effects. So I was a little bit wondering why you were, were interested in the cholinergic system, or are you, whereas you were mainly interested in the monaminergic. And then I bring you to chapter five, where you study the role of the PPN, uh, and then you investigate the effects of uh, uh, stimulation uh, on the cholinergic cells in the PPM. But the PPM is actually, uh, I, I investigated a little bit more deeper and it's a quite interesting structure um, because it's not only as a choline neurons that you find in PPM, but there are also dopaminergic, GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in, in that uh, structure. And there's a complex interaction between the STN and the sub and substantia pars compacta. So it's a really interesting uh, structure. I have two questions. One question is uh, related to why did you look for the cholinergic um, neurons, whereas you were more interested in the in the monoaminergic uh, uh, neurotransmission, as reading from your title. Um, I know there is some relevance in the literature that shows that there is a cholinergic interaction there going on, but why didn't you look for dopamine? Because that was more the focus of your, of your thesis. So that will be my first question. I have a follow-up question if you um, give me a satisfying answer to my first question. Highly esteemed uh, opponent. Uh, actually, I, 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 I agree with your concern. Uh, this, uh, this, this findings was interesting in the last years of my year. So it wasn't the primary, primary uh, focus. Mm -hmm. However, when we performed a study in nanoparticle, we, we found also uh, that the nanoparticle does not affect, affect the styphoid. And then when we shared our results and outcome from uh, our colleagues in Aachen, they found also there is no effect of DBS in the styphoid energy. So it's part of a similar effect between the electric wire DBS and also the new novel approach, the nanoparticle one. So I, I found it interesting that I, I find it in the new novel approach also, the cytokine was not, uh, the cytokine cell activity was not affected by uh, deep brain stimulation as well as the convention. This is what, bring back that, turn out our attention just to compare the new, the new approaches with the old approaches. Yeah, but my this question the, was, my question was, why didn't you also look at dopamine in the PPM? And why did you focus on ah, the yeah. acetyl colon? Uh, actually, yeah, we, Actually, we didn't study that dopaminergic neuron in the PVN yeah. because the, 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 the most relevant uh, uh, is the acetylcholine in improving the DBS motor symptoms. Uh, yeah. Not the motor symptoms, I mean the gait and axial symptoms of mm. Parkinson. It has been shown in preclinic that the, the DBS of the PVN improved the mm -hmm. gait and uh, and uh, and axial symptoms in, relate, in relation to acetylcholine. Yeah, yeah but, but, but I mean, it's also glutamate and GABA that can, you can find in, in, in the connections with different uh, other regions. So it makes a very complex uh, interaction between the PPN and the other regions that are relevant for Parkinson's disease. So, um, and then of course, dopamine is a very obvious one to look at in the PPN. Then what would you expect then in the PPN? Do you, would you see any change in dopamine when you stimulate the STM? As far as, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I didn't look into the dopaminergic okay. neuron mm -hmm. in, in the dental time, especially, yeah. So mm -hmm. it was focused on, on the real, in the midbrain area that was directly responsible to the therapeutic effect or the side effect of DBS. But Mm. I didn't go, to be honest, into detail of the dopamine and the time. Okay, okay. Yeah, 
Okay, so um, I can understand you don't, you, you can't know everything about this very complex uh, network involved there. So um, um, maybe something for a follow-up um, a PZ project to to look into that uh, more deeply. Yeah. But then again, so the, once again, no, I'm, I'm, by the... I, I'm afraid we run out, are running out of time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah a, that's a pity, but and then I understand also that it is the case. So then I will um, stop my questioning here and I will pass the word to the, the next opponent. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Pro. Thank you for your position, uh, Professor Blogland. Time goes quickly when you have uh, a nice academic discussion. We go to the following opponent, and that's Dr. Ackermans, and she's a neurosurgeon in the Maastricht University Medical Center in. Maastricht, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pro Rector. Dear Mr. Candidate, first of all, my sincerest congratulations to you and your promotion team. It's a great achievement to finish a thesis like this about the DBS and mechanisms. And you and your team always kept in mind the clinical, societal, and ethical impact of your research. So, my congratulations. But also, some questions from my side. First, uh, about chapter six. You know I'm a neurosurgeon, so you stated in chapter six that the nanoparticles uh, you prefer can be injected directly in the brain. But this is also an invasive treatment. But you stated also that it is possible to inject the nanoparticles in the blood to inward the circulation and crossing the blood-brain barrier. So the nanoparticles reach the brain. So to treat Parkinson patients, they don't need a neurosurgeon anymore and I can send them to your lab. So I'm completely uh, without any uh, work anymore. Please, do you think this is the future? Uh, Esteem Obelant, thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, I, I, I can only speculate. I, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really early to 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 tell that, but uh, yeah, it's this technology is really developing fast. Now, we only are examining the, their effect and trying to understand the mechanism of action of this uh, nanoparticle. But I believe in the future it will be yeah. There will be a, a, yeah further development because it's really ongoing research and a lot yeah a lot of advancement happened and a lot of advancement will go. I believe yeah I believe will a lot of surgery will be less invasive. I don't think you will not need a neurosurgeon. I think the delivery to the target brain maybe need some really good neurosurgeon and also to assure that it's already in the right place and doing the, the stimulation in a correct way without, uh, without any complication. Yeah, this is a lot, we need a lot of people to monitor and to follow up this, but yeah. But, but I you think have to do the same, excuse me, you have to do the same in mice to be very precise, avoid complications, take care of your mice patients. So you do the same yeah. as what I did. Yeah, but it will be for uh, not mice this time, for human. And you okay. need people that we are really sk highly skilled in the human brain anatomy and, and the side effect, and they, they have to monitor their, their, uh, the, sci the, the health science and the value vitals. And the, if there are any like, uh, complication, so it's not going to be only science. When it's translated to clinic, need the clinicians. Yes, of course. And you concluded in chapter six, uh, and you're a little bit downscaling the hype of the nanoparticles in the treatment of patients. Uh, what do you think is the main disadvantage of the nanoparticles? Uh, is there maybe an option to, combi to combine DBS with uh, insertion of nanoparticles or tr treat them in the same surgery? Uh. If we use the same conventional, we will uh, we will lose one of the advantage we we're tr we're trying to advocate. 
uh, the, uh, that the invasiveness. We are really the first, uh, yeah, the first advantage of this nanotechnology is to to have less in, uh, invasive uh, uh, approaches. But yeah, they maybe will create new challenges that if this nanoparticle will stay around the person in the tissue uh, cells for how long and for how long this stay safe and yeah, if they're gonna uh, cluster or they kind of like be stable, all of this gonna be for future uh, challenges and uh, to be resolved in the future. So, so I think it will, uh, so yeah. What do you think is the next step in research to uh, make the translation from nanoparticles from mice towards human? If you have all the researches, time, money left, what is the next step in research you should advise your promotion team or in your future career to focus on if we can do much more research what what do you focus on what is the next step uh, yeah i know that there is already uh, ongoing research that they, they they try to investigate the long term safety and the, the long term, how they react. The second important thing, how to, uh, with minimum invasive approach, deliver this nanoparticle to the specific brain region. And yeah, this, I can, yeah, in going research, they try to use uh, approaches like focus ultrasound to deliver this tissue uh, to cross the blood uh, brain barrier. And yeah, I think, yeah. This is the ongoing research now, and then let's see what will happen in the future. And what do you think about the ethical aspects of nanoparticles, just only by injection? Can you discuss about that? Are there eth ethical considerations regarding the nanoparticles? Yeah, actually, the ethical consideration need to be really taken into account and you need to be uh, discussed and addressed that uh, you inject with the nanoparticle that uh, I'm not supposed to say that, but have bad history that they toxic to some organs, but it's not the case for with this non new nanoparticle is developed to be biocompatible, to be uh, stable. And then, uh, yeah, so this consideration of for safety and uh, uh, if the patient willing to inject this new nanoparticle into the blood bloodstream, this all need to be the for yeah, and then the uh, the privacy for the patient, uh, and yeah, the, all of this need to be discussed and uh, to be to, taken into account. Yeah, okay. so it will be one of the issues, the ethical consideration. Can I have ask another question, Prorector? No, I'm no. sorry. I will discuss my questions later with you. Thank you for your uh, answers. Yeah. And I give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ackermans, for your opposition. Uh, and I'm afraid you have to save this question for later because we have uh, still uh, uh, one more opponent and that's Professor Al Gamdi. She's Professor of Neuroscience in the King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And thank you, Professor oh, Al Gamdi for coming all the way, albeit online from Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you so much. And first of all, congratulations uh, to uh, Mr. Saimi and uh, all the team for this, um, uh, for this great work and uh, promising results. Um, okay, um, just I'm wondering um, about the mortality rate uh, after the MPTP injection and even after the surgery. Sometimes you write the total number of the, of the mice used in the study, but when I see the results, um, I can see that there is the number per group is not matching with the total number. So is it um, related to the mortality rate after the, uh, the, the surgery done or stereotaxic injection? Uh, highly esteemed uh, Obenen, thank you for your question. So uh, first of all, I will discuss the, 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 dropping, uh, the dropping of our animals. Uh, it was not all of them because of the mortality rate, but we did a histology using H and E, and any mice that do not have uh, an accurate 
DBS electrode trajectory that really uh, sharply indicated in the STM was uh, dropped out from the both the behavior and the histological uh, histology study. So yeah, this regarding the dropout of uh, the, the mortality rate, I don't know the figure for sure, but it's not it's not high. The, 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 the mice experience uh, weight loss and they sometimes there is some mice die, but yeah, it's not the the majority, but I don't have the exact figure to be honest. Okay, uh, the second question uh, is in the behavioral uh, results. Um, you have done the uh, gate analysis and this model is to study the, um, the motor sim uh, symptoms in the Parkinson's. Um, when you've done the forced swimming test, uh, how you um, uh, ensure the validity of that results in a model that used the motor symptoms of uh, Parkinson's disease? I mean that um, some of the previous papers that they said that uh, they prefer to use uh, another model uh, which related to non-motor symptoms of the Parkinson's disease to study these, uh, the depression, for example, or other uh, symptoms in that model. So just my question is how to ensure the validity of the uh, force swimming test and uh, about the results. So, yeah. Uh... Uh, for the, uh, the, the, the first swim test uh, validity was published in, uh, in the previous uh, protocol pre uh, and it's used for despair-like behavior in mice. So we measured the uh, immobility of the mice, how, how they are un uh, mobile for how long, and then we compare it for the other between the groups and we found that there is like um, the brisk like behavior more in the DBS and uh, stimulated animal. Is that the, the, the question or I may be able um, to get Okay, have we done the um, uh, total distance move or the open field test in that model before you um, study the force swimming test just, just to ensure that the uh, the activity or the lock motion activity of these groups are similar or not? For open field test, we didn't find, uh, we only, uh, the open test, uh, uh, we didn't perform it in this. We used another uh, test for, for uh, locomotion, which is the, the catwalk test. Okay, okay. So we didn't um, use it for this study. Okay. Um, we will go to the open uh, field test in uh, chapter seven. And uh, in the open field test, usually we rely on the, um, on the um, uh, broad and natural exploration, okay? And usually we found that uh, the mice exploration uh, maximum in three minutes. After, the, after that, the, 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 the mice just take one corner and sit and, does, and he, she, he's doing nothing yeah. in that. Yeah. Uh, 10 minutes, I feel that it's too, long for um, the uh, total distance move. Have you faced that with your rats uh, or mice? I, I cannot remember for sure, but what we do, they, we, we, we leave one, uh, two, three minutes habitations, and then we take the middle three minutes. I asked. To five minutes. So can I continue? And you can finish your answer. Yeah, so I, I, I did through the analysis, like I, I take the 10 minutes and then I have an analysis first five and the second five minutes to see. And then I excluded the first two minutes as a habitation that the, the mice try yeah, to walk around. So, and then we found there is no significant difference between. So in our study, I didn't notice that they, they stay yeah. in the place and then, then move. they move all the time, but maybe this because they are stimulated or I don't know. Okay. I'm not Thank quite you. sure, but we didn't face this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Al-Gamdi, for your 
uh, opposition. And uh, Mr. Candidate, Mr. Alosaimi, the time appointed for the defense of your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the way you defended it. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberation and our return. And having said that, I suspend this meeting.
So I reopen this uh, academic ceremony in which Mr. Alosaimi has defended his thesis. And Mr. Alosaimi, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to, de to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Temel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch uni university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Faisal Mohammed al the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beetle. Myself, congratulations, and I, uh, Dr. Jahan Shah, he will do the loud dance. I will, I'm handing on uh, the word to him. Thank you very much. Um, here, Dr. Alosaimi, here, Faisal. Uh, first and foremost, uh, foremost, I would like to congratulate you, uh, your wife, uh, your family uh, for this uh, academic achievement. Uh, it has been a privilege to witness your growth and uh, dedication throughout your academic journey. I still remember our first meeting seven years ago um, on that Friday afternoon during our weekly lab meeting. Uh, from the beginning, you showed a keen interest in joining our team um, for, for your PhD studies. We discussed the potential project and your in enthusiasm for it was evident. Despite it disappearing for a couple of years, you reached out to us uh, with exciting news of receiving a scholarship to come back to the Netherlands for your PhD. Without hesitation, we gladly welcomed you and uh, your PhD journey began, of course, which was not without its challenges. One of the initial hurdles uh, was catching up with the laboratory skills. Since your background was medicine uh, with limited wet lab experience, however, uh, your determination and hard work allowed you to quickly acquire the necessary skills and become an independent researcher. Your resilience uh, in overcoming obstacles were further tested when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, disrupting our efforts and causing significant delays to your project. Despite these unforeseen challenges, you remained determined. I also want to acknowledge the personal hardships you faced during this time. The loss of your brother and your father added emotional burden to your journey. However, you demonstrated exceptional strength uh, in navigating throughout um, these um, difficulties and uh, persevering your academic journey. Throughout five years, we worked together. You consistently exhibited qualities that I highly admire. You have been an excellent team player, always willing to support and assist your fellow PhD students uh, with their projects. As a result, your publication list grew significantly, showcasing your commitment to collaboration and knowledge sharing. Moreover, I greatly appreciate your patience and trust in your supervisors, as you never once complained about your project. These qualifications are essential for success in academia and I have no doubt they will continue to serve you uh, in your future career. On a lighter note, I must express my gratitude for introducing me to Arabic coffee. 
a delightful beverage with its origin in Arab Peninsula. Apart from the academic aspects, your presence and the cultural exchange we had uh, will be greatly missed. So once again, I congratulate you for this accomplishment. And I have no doubt that you will continue to accomplish more in your future academic career. So um, I also would like to, uh, uh, on behalf of the School of uh, Mental Health and Neuroscience, uh, I'm entitled to hand out an official certi certificate to you. The owner of this certificate has shown to have uh, received adequate training in um, diverse academic skills and has gained relevant experience to become a successful and independent scholar. So this is the certificate that uh, you receive based on the qualifications that you have and courses that you follow. I give the word back to Prorector. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jahan Shai, for this beautiful laudation. And dear Dr. Alo Saimi, also on behalf of the uh, Maastricht University and its deans, I congratulate you with the doctor with the degree of doctor that you have acquired. I hope you have time to celebrate it and uh, this important uh, day in your scientific career. I also congratulate, of course, your uh, family and friends uh, online and I uh, wish you a great day. I also would like to extend my con congratulations to your team, Professor Temel, Dr. Jahan Shahi and Dr. Hesham. I would like to thank the members of the oppositions for their hard work and their presence, and of course, the technical support team to make this online uh, academic ceremony possible. And of course, also the Beatle. Having said that all, I close this academic session. <laughs>